I realize it's not just it's not nine yet, but uh, I, I can start slowly with um, with a recap of, of um, what we have seen so far. So <clears throat> the, the first thing we have seen that a conformal field theory is characterized by a set of um, of conformal primary local operators, and these local operators were labeled by their dimension and, and a spin, their scaling dimension and the spin. And then we have seen that the list of all dimensions and spins for all operators is, the, is what we call the spectrum of the theory. I will give some example now to, to make the discussion less abstract. And, um, and then for every triplet of primary operators, you can define the OP coefficients, Cijk, and all this is what we call the CFT data. We have also seen that, um, is that large enough for people in the back? Yeah. We have also seen that a beautiful property of conformal field theories is that all higher point correlations, two point functions, three point functions, etc., can be written in terms of the um, of the comfort of the CFT data. So just to give you a flavor, so this data is usually hard to compute. And uh, the simplest theory you can have, let's say that you have a free theory in four dimensions. So for instance, for a, a free theory in four dimensions, we will start writing down operators, their dimensions, and their spin. So for instance, you have the free scalar field phi, and that is a scalar field, so it has dimension spin zero and dimension one. Then you could consider the, the second simplest operator, which is phi square, still uh, this has dimension two and has a spin zero. Then you could try to consider, for instance, something like d mu phi, but d mu phi we will not consider because this is a descendant of phi. It's a derivative of, of this operator here. So this is not a primary operator. If you want a primary operator, you need to act with derivatives on two fields. So for instance, you could consider d mu d nu phi and d mu phi d nu phi. Now, one of this combination with the plus sign will be a double derivative of this, so it's a descendant, while the other combination with a minus sign is, is a primary operator. So this operator here has dimension four and a spin two. Then you can also consider something like, for instance, phi d mu phi d mu phi, together with the other combination. And since the indices mu are contracted, this has a spin zero, but it has dimension four. And like that, you can construct all a bunch of operators, and you can just count their dimension, and, and you can have a look at their spin. Of course, this is a free conformal field theory. If you have a theory with a coupling constant, and you turn on the coupling constant, all these numbers get corrected. And, and the, what people want to do, for instance, this one could become 1 plus g minus g squared over root 2 plus etc. And it is usually very hard to compute these coefficients. And uh, furthermore, for some theories, you don't even have a Lagrangian, so there is not even a systematic way to compute that. Or you may be interested, in, interested, for instance, so this is the dimension of phi as a function of g, so you may be interested, for instance, in knowing what is the value of this dimension when g is equal to 1. And this, I don't know, I will just make that something up, it can be 1.43. And you know, and to compute these things are usually very hard. And if you want to compute something like that, and the theory has a Lagrangian, then there is actually, at least there is a systematic way to compute these things. 
If you want to compute something like this, there is no way to do that so far. Like none of the techniques you have learned so far are useful to compute something like this. We will learn in this lecture how to, how to give information about this. So this was basically a recap. It's like a South American soap opera. I start by telling what I, we did before. Now, are there any questions about this before we start with the lecture of today? Yeah? Was this useful? At least you can see a few operators and, and what are these deltas, etc. Now, let's go back to our beloved equation, to our bootstrap equation. And what we will start today is by giving, by giving the idea of the numerical bootstrap. We will spend about half an hour on it. Now, we have derived, we have started with the four-point function. Let's say we start, we consider a scalar field. Now, this is a scalar field that is not in the, um, this doesn't have to be the fundamental field, doesn't have to be this. We don't have to be in the free theory. It's any scalar field of, of the conformal field theory. And from it, we have derived the crossing equation. And we wrote the crossing equation as a sum over intermediate operators times the square of these OP coefficients, B to the delta phi, and these are the conformal blocks. I gave the expressions for the conformal blocks in four dimensions. If I don't write large enough, please uh, tell me. Delta phi minus V to the delta phi. And this has to be equal to 1. Now, the idea of the numeric bootstrap the first observation is that this equation becomes much more powerful when we supplement it by another physical constraint. And this physical constraint is the physical constraint of unitarity. Unitarity implies the following. So unitarity, when you have a theory and, and you require unitarity, so you are using quantum mechanics, for instance, and the idea of unitarity implies that probabilities cannot be negative. So they are always a non-negative number. And furthermore, if you have a states of your theory, the norm of these states should always be bigger or equal than zero. So in, in conformal field theories, it is very much the same and the consequences of unitarity is that for a given spin L, delta is bigger or equal than L plus D minus 2 for a spin equals 1, 2, etc., and delta is bigger or equal than d over 2 minus 1 for a spin equals 0. So for instance, we see that if we plug d equals 4, we get delta has to be bigger or equal than 1, so that um, the scalar field in four dimensions, the free scalar field, exactly saturates the unitary bound. So if you turn on some coupling, then it means that this dimension has to go up. Otherwise, it would violate this inequality. So I can write whatever I want here, since I am making this up, but I have to write something positive. So this is a small consequence of unitarity. Is that OK? Good. And the other condition, the other constraint that will be quite important for us is that actually this C delta L square, they have the probability of 
the first two operators, O1 and O2, to go into the intermediate operator um, labeled by delta and L. So this has to be bigger or equal than zero, or bigger than zero. In other words, the C delta Ls, they have to be some real numbers. That's something we haven't said before, but these OP coefficients, they have to be some real numbers. And as a consequence, the square of these OP coefficients has to be positive. So far, so good. Are you happy with this? Any questions? Yes. Oh, sorry. No. So, the, yeah, that's an excellent question, actually. So, for the... Um, so, in, in these conventions, uh, actually, it's even more than that. So, for us, the, when you have two identical operators, like this, the intermediate states are always intermediate states of this form, like gamma, d mu, d nu phi, or you could have gamma, d mu, d rho, or d mu 1, d mu 2, d mu 3, d mu 4, etc. And, and this L labels a symmetric traceless representation of the Lorentz group. And actually, for all our applications, actually, thank you very much for, for this question, this L will be an even number. So when I say L, actually, I, I am being a little bit sloppy. What, what I mean is this. More in general, the, the mathematical structure of the conformal algebra is SOD, 2, and you will have to give a, a representation of SOD. So you may have more than one number. You may have like L1, L2. But, uh, but, but for, for all the applications in this course, actually this L measures the length, basically, of how many derivatives we have here, and it will always be an even number, even integer. Yes? Oh, sorry. It's just... Uh, it's like the OPE. So we, we are considering the OP of this operator with this. So, sorry about that. It, it's just an OP. So it, it's like this is one operator and this is another operator, as opposed to the operator phi square. It's just, sorry, it's just bad notation. Is that okay? So now, the, the idea is quite smart, actually, and it took 20 years, but... Uh, but it's quite worth. So the first point, this is not too fundamental, but everyone does it, is to call this with a different name. So we start by doing this. We write down the bootstrap equation, and we call all this thing inside the parentheses F delta L. Now, what we do, we assume a putative spectrum, so we write that, and then we assume, let me write it here, because I, I want, so we will assume a specific spectrum. So, if here is delta, let's say here L is equal to zero, L is equal to two, if we have only even operators, L is equal to four, and so on, and I declare that the spectrum of my theory is given by this for spin zero, by all these operators for spin two, all these operators with spin four, etc. So this is just some spectrum that I assume. And now, once we have assumed this spectrum, this spectrum has to be uh, consistent with unitarity, so it cannot start too soon because of these constraints. And now, what we do is we look for the following linear operator. So try to find, so imagine someone bets you a lot of money that you cannot find this, 
and you try to say, yes, I can, because you are very uh, stubborn. And you look for a linear operator which takes functions of u and v into real numbers. For instance, such a linear operator could be equals to f one quarter, one quarter. That, if you give me a function of u and v, I will give you a real number that is this. And you look for a linear operator. This is an example. Eh? It can be much more complicated by than that, any linear operator, for which phi of f delta L uv is bigger or equal than zero for all your spectrum, for all delta L among in the in the, among the intermediate operators. So you assume a spectrum for the intermediate operators delta L, and then you look for a linear operator such that this is positive, but also such that when you act on one, this is a smaller than zero. Now, if you can find, if you can find such a linear operator, you see that we are in trouble, right? Because if you can find this linear operator, then it means that if you act here in this equation with this linear operator, you would get positive numbers times positive numbers equal to some negative number. So what can you de derive, what can you conclude from this? So let's assume you can find this linear operator. The conclusion is that the spectrum was not good. The spectrum is not consistent with unitarity. So if you can find it, if you can, we can rule out the spectrum. Sorry? Yeah? But if you cannot move the operators, then that doesn't work. You may start... Sorry, I, I don't know what... Oper so if you can find any operator, if, if an operator exists, right? If there exists such a phi, any phi you can think of, then it means that the operator you started with, the, the spectrum you started with, is not a good spectrum. Yes? Yes? Absolutely. That's the conclusions. Absolutely. Well, this, right. So, so that's the point. How, so how this, um, how people does that is they, um, so there is some art going on into this. And what people actually, the only thing they have to fix is what are these starting points here and here. And they say that the spectrum lies somewhere here. So actually, the only assumptions are these assumptions here. And what people can see is that you can study this system numerically with a computer. And rather than studying this for an infinite number of, of operators, that would be incredibly hard, you study only 2,000 or 3,000 operators. And then you hope that the things you find don't depend on the things you find here. I will tell you in a second what kind of things you find. But in practice, you are right. But in practice, what people do, they pick some cutoff in the spin and some cutoff in the dimension. And they play with this. They also had at the beginning some cutoff in this distance. Um, so, yeah, 
So, so indeed, so in principle, there is an infinite number of, of, of conditions. They have improved on that, and now some things. Um, so it turns out, so let, let me tell you very quickly, it actually it turns out that because of properties of conformal blocks, you can see how linear operators act on conformal blocks when their dimension or spin is very hard. So they control this part of the diagram in one way and this other part of the diagram numerically. And that's how they proceed. But at the end of the day, this procedure is rigorous. But, but you are right, in principle, if you really wanted to do this, you would need an infinite number of constraints because this may be an infinite spectrum. But they have some way to control that. And the only input you have to give to this problem is basically what are these starting points. Is that okay? There is a very nice mathematical way to think about this. Uh, and I think th this is the nicest... Um, yes. Absolutely. And then, yeah. So what I say... No. So the bootstrap equation implies this, right? But unitarity also requires this coefficient. Let me, let me tell a new thing. And like that, I think I will answer your question very precisely. Um, so another way to see this, to see this more mathematically, so I, I think this is a nice way to see that, is that when you have pick a spectrum, you can interpret So imagine that I give you a spectrum, right, delta L, and this spectrum is equivalent to choosing a basis of functions F delta I Li. So you will have a basis of functions F delta I Li, and now mathematically, a basis, What you are doing, mathematically, is you have to write one in that basis. Right? So, indeed, this is what we are doing here. If we think of these functions, f delta l, as a basis of functions for all functions in U and B, then what we are doing, we are writing one in that basis. And what we need, what we need then, is that all the coefficients on that linear combination have to be positive. Sorry, I, 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 go, I, I don't hear your question, but let me write that and I, I will get closer to you. All coefficients have to be positive. If they are not, it means that the basis you have chosen is just not the correct basis. Is that okay? It's, um, is that okay? Yeah, good. Yes. Right, of course, like, um, like yeah, this is, a, this is a good question. Um, it, it's actually quite hard to see. To, there, there is a lot of properties that are extremely hard to see. And you may ask all sorts of questions. You may ask whether this converges, for instance. And that's very related to what you are asking. So it is true that you act with a linear operator on the left, with a linear operator on the right, and you are assuming that both things converge. But in mathematics, we know a lot of examples where this doesn't work, right? And, and so in the starting point of the conformal bootstrap, they notice all these things. And then over the years, they proved a lot of properties regarding these conformal blocks, these OP coefficients that ensure that all this process actually works. So I didn't want to spend too much time in the numerical bootstrap, but these are all very good questions, actually. And, 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 uh, and, yeah. and even the properties, so whether, for instance, so the question was whether 
if you pick a spectrum, this is a complete basis or not. You know, it could be an over-complete basis, etc. But uh, so the point is that the problem is infinite dimensional. You can, but the, what they do, they truncate it in such a way that it's always a finite dimensional problem. For a finite dimensional problem, then writing one in terms of a basis of function is always a well-defined finite dimensional problem. And then they truncate it less and less, and they see how things converge. But then they have some theorems. Is that OK? Yeah. Oh, sorry. So I have two questions. Yes. Right. So I know I can give you an example, which is actually beautiful. Yes, of course. So, so the, the question was uh, whether this basis is ortho, orthonormal. And, uh, and if there are theories for which this is orthonormal, a very nice example to play with, which is very neat and simple, is this free theory. So in free theory, the deltas and the spins are all integers. And you can actually play with this, with integer delta and L. And then they are all nice and neat and orthogonal. And one can actually write down one in terms of that. And one can do, do everything. Of course, in general, you don't know what these deltas are. So it's quite hard to tell about these properties. Yeah, it's a good question. Yes. So, it's, so here, the, it's just functions of u and b with certain properties. Oh, sorry. So what I, am to what I was talking about, so again, le le let me tell you a little bit more. So the kind of linear operators that people pick, so one linear operator is the, the value of these functions at one quarter, one quarter. And the reason why they do this is that the convergence of this double sum around u and v equals one quarter is actually pretty good. So that, that's an important point. And an important point of the conformal bootstrap is that there is some space, there is some region of a space, which is around u equals one quarter and v equals one quarter, in which these sums converge nicely. I was talking about that sum, these sums. But of course, the convergence property depends whether this grows exponentially or decreases exponentially, properties of conformal blocks, and, and they, they are quite complicated. But what they do in the conformal block, in the, sorry, in the numerical bootstrap, they basically have uh, u, v, and they show that around that region, things converge nicely. And, and they study the, the bootstrap equation around that region. Is that OK? So I was talking about that convergence. Yeah, so let, let me, uh, so if you remember, thank you for the question. I didn't know whether to answer it or not, but now uh, thank you. Uh, we introduced coordinates in which u was equal to set set bar and v is equal to 1 minus z, 1 minus z bar. We will come back to these equations. In, in convergence, usually in these set set bar coordinates, is inside the unit disk. And, and in terms of set, it's so much better. It's just the middle point at which set equals set bar is equal to 1 half. So these set set bar are between 0 and 1, and it's just the middle point. But in terms of the set variables, in terms of u and b, is, is uh, one half, one half. Is that OK? So the idea is that if you have the bootstrap equation like this, this both this sum and this sum converge around set set bar equals one half. And then you can study the bootstrap equation from it. Is that OK? So let me tell you something in five minutes, the, the kind of, of uh, information that you can find from this numeric bootstrap. Um, so thank you so much for the questions. I, I love it, actually. So please keep asking. Um, so let me tell you something in five minutes, and then I will take more questions before 
we go to the analytic boost to the yeah analytic bootstrap. As you will see, the big difference with the between the numeric and analytic in the numeric bootstrap, we sit on regions in which these things converge nicely. In the analytic, we will go to regions in which things are very dangerous, and we will try to to play with that. So the kind of things <clears throat> that one uh, one does with the numeric bootstrap are the following. So imagine that you have a four-dimensional theory. So these were some of the first results of the conformal bootstrap, of the numeric bootstrap. So imagine that you have a four-dimensional theory, not free. It could be any interacting theory. And then you consider the OPE of the field phi with itself. This phi is a scalar field of dimension delta phi. If the theory is free, delta phi is one, but the theory doesn't have to be free. It can be anything. And then we assume that in the OPE of phi x with phi zero, we have several operators, delta phi, and we will assume that the first operator is an operator which we will call phi square. Now, this phi square here is just a name. I could have called this Fernando, and I would have liked to do so, but the original authors didn't think uh, that was a good name. And if you are in a free theory, if the theory is free, then this operator would be usually what you would call phi square. But this theory doesn't have to be free. So the eigenfunctions of the dilatation operator could be, you know, like a horrible combination. Right? So here we are not making any assumptions. It's just a name. And, and um, so this is just a name. And the dimension of this operator, we call it delta phi square. So people in the numerical bootstrap, they went and again, they assume this putative spectrum here. Notice that by construction, The dimension of this operator here is delta phi square. Here you could give another name. It's an operator of a spin 2 with the smallest dimension, spin 4 with the smallest dimension, etc. And what they have seen, yes. Yeah. There is a lot of art there. There is a lot of art. I mean, you can start. So let, let me tell you what the answer is, and I think it, that will answer what you, what you are asking. It's a good question. What they have found, and, and let, me, let, me, uh, let me write this, what they have found is that actually, if delta phi square is too high, then you can find a linear operator, and the spectrum can be ruled out. In other words, what they have found is that unitarity plus the bootstrap equation, etc., it gives upper bounds for delta phi square. In other words, and to answer your question, what happens is that if these starting points are too high, then you actually can find a linear operator. So they start from something quite high or from something quite low. They cannot find the, the, the spectrum. 
the, sorry, the linear operator, and they start raising all these numbers until they can find a spectrum. And that point where between you couldn't find the linear operator and now you can find the linear operator gives you the upper bound for what this delta phi square can be. Is that okay? So, there are these beautiful pictures that they draw. And, and the kind of pictures, hopefully, you can all see it. Here is delta phi square, and the bound actually depends on what delta phi is. It starts at 2 here and at a 1. And you find, actually, that all this region is excluded by unitarity plus crossing symmetry. So, uh, for instance, what they found was that if delta phi is equal to 1, delta phi square has to be at least 2. And that we knew, and it's actually the answer for the free theory, right? This and this. But what is remarkable is that if delta phi, right, is let's say 1.5, then delta phi square has to be at least 2.7. And this is a very rigorous, non-perturbative result about conformal field theories. And you even haven't assumed the existence or not of a Lagrangian. Right? Later people, and that's why they are very excited, they noted that a lot of interesting theories, so in principle, crossing symmetry, uh, excludes all this, but it allows a lot of room. But it turns out that actually a lot of theories, of actual conformal field theories, they live at this boundary of, of the allowed regions. So all these bounds seem to be actually saturated. Is that okay? So this is the very basic picture of, of the numerical bootstrap. There has been like 300 papers on this over the last 10 years, so I, I am not going to cover this in, in half a lecture, but uh, is that okay? Yes. Oh, yes. There, there is, there is uh, well, it, it, it's actually, so here, so later people, what, what they have done, they have, uh, they have considered theories, sorry, they have considered more general correlators. And what seems to happen if you consider other correlators, let's say phi prime, phi prime, phi phi, phi prime, phi prime, phi prime, phi prime, etc., is that everything starts being excluded. This is excluded, something like that is excluded. And in such a way that the not excluded regions ended up being some little islands. And with these islands, they say, aha, there should be a conformal field theory living there. Of course, there is a lot of art. And you have, the more you put some assumption, then uh, you, you find something else. You, you may recall, for instance, that the, we have seen the stress tensor. And the stress tensor was very cool because the stress tensor has a protected dimension, always D, and also has a protected OP coefficient. So if you put that input here in the bootstrap equation, all, all your predictions improve a little bit. But you know, this has taken many years. But, uh, but now people is seeing these little islands, and all the rest is excluded. And in those islands, some CFT lives, which is quite cool. It's, uh... Sorry? Oh. Let's, let's um, well, from this point of view, unitarity is crucial. Because, like, from this point of view, you have heavily used the fact that these coefficients C delta L are actually positive, the square of C delta L. So, from this, unitarity is absolutely crucial. When I will answer that question in one hour, hopefully, or, or in the next, in the afternoon, uh, 
Yeah, the analytic bootstrap uses unitarity much less. But here, unitarity is actually quite important. Is that okay? Yeah? Shall we move to the analytic? No, we shouldn't. Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, they don't, but the, the conformal bootstrap, they appear somewhere here and somewhere here. The conformal bootstrap gives constraints on all these operators. I am not writing them, but uh, yeah. The, oh, this delta phi is actually so far the only input of your bootstrap equation. Notice that the bootstrap equation has only delta phi as a parameter. So they set delta phi equals one, and they run the program. Delta phi 1.1, they run the program again, and they compute all these upper bounds. And that's what they found. Of course, you can have more complicated things where, we, where you have many uh, functions, etc. And then, you, for some theories, you may have more parameters. Yeah. But, like, in, 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 yeah, anyway. Yeah, is that okay? Yes. Good question. So, it is possible, and here in the simplest, uh, so, you, you may ask why phi itself was not part of that. So, in many models, one can assume, like the icing model, etc., one can assume a C2 symmetry, and this C2 symmetry will forbid phi from appearing in the OPE of phi with phi, because this symmetry will imply that the three-point function is equal to minus itself, and hence has to be zero. But that you could also study a model without this, you could put phi here, and you can try to take care of it by subtracting it. Uh, uh, you, you can explicitly subtract it, and you get actually very similar pictures. No. So not from that, but actually, if you consider many other correlators, actually you do. And, and, and these islands, so in models like the icing model, etc., these islands is actually, you know, it also tells you that delta phi can be only between here and here. Here I should make a small distinction. You have some conformal field theories, like the conformal field theory describing boiling water, and you should think of these theories as a theory in which the coupling constant has been fixed to something, to one. If you have fixed g to one, let's say, then this delta will have some value, 1.43. There are other conformal field theories that have coupling constants. And then it means that all the, the theory is conformal for all values of g. And then in those situations, you don't have any, I mean, delta phi can go between one and whatever, but all the other things will have to be fixed in terms of that in the real theories. Is that okay? So, good. Shall we go to the analytic bootstrap now? So, it, it's, it's more, I hope the idea is more or less clear of the, of the numeric bootstrap. Sorry, I, I don't think I made... Um, this is, of course, like very, very brief. Yes. Yeah, is your question whether this is a necessary or insufficient condition? Yeah, no, no, no. It's certainly not sufficient. It's certainly not sufficient. So, uh, it, it, to, fi to find a sufficient condition, you would have to study all four-point correlators. Yeah, so this is a necessary condition. It doesn't mean that the spectrum, you ha even if you, cannot if you cannot find your linear operator, it doesn't mean that the spectrum the CFT is unitary, but that's a necessary condition. Yes. But however, again, I mean, there are these theories, I, I will erase while I ask, answer, sorry, I, I don't. So there are these theories that they don't have a coupling constant, and for these theories, it is believed. But, but even that, I mean, people is asking whether these islands should really go to a point, but they have been getting smaller and smaller over the years, and they are really small, actually. 
It's mostly numerical evidence. Yeah. Ah, yeah. But I, I, I think, yeah, I, I think it's extremely precise, by the way. I mean, some of these results, they determine these islands, they determine the dimensions to six digits or something like that. So it's pretty cool. So now, let me give you the idea of the, I am not sure I will be able to do this today, but in the morning, but we will start, we will go back to our beloved equation. Sorry, I love it. You don't have to love it, but. Uh, and let, let me write the equation like that. Yes, of course. Sorry, too early for me. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, this equation uh, is, of course, a mess, as we have already discussed. Sometimes we will call this channel a direct channel, and this channel, we will call it the cross channel. And the problem with this equation is that if you take one operator on the left, that maps to a very complicated infinite linear combination on the right. In order to, to, to find some information about this equation, I have to spend some time telling you some of the properties of conformal blocks. So, so far, I've been nice to you. This is about to stop. Sorry about that. But at some point, we need some details on these conformal blocks. Now, the conformal blocks, they have several properties. The first property, I, I would like to keep this. But if you cannot see, please tell me. So these properties of conformal blocks are quite important. First, they are eigenfunctions of a quadratic Casimir operator. So there is an operator C quadratic operator such that if you act on g delta l uv this gives you back the same function times this quantity here This is the first property. The second property is their small U behavior. And to make the U behavior explicitly explicit, sometimes we will introduce the following notation. Rather than talking about this, we will denote U to the tau over 2 F tau L, U, V. Where here, this is just a notation, but I have to tell you what tau is. Where tau is the dimension minus the spin, and it's called the twist of the operator. This twist will be actually quite important for us. And the... And the important point about this twist is that it controls the small u behavior of the conformal block. And this, if you take the small u, the precise small u limit, there is some function tau l. This is called collinear function. It doesn't matter, it's just a name. Plus dot, dot, dot. And a nice feature of this collinear function is that the 
it is known in any number of dimensions, and it always has the following form. Sorry, sorry. The, the, oh, so this is not visible. Good. Well, it's not good per se, but it's good you told me. <laughs> Where this F tau L collinear V is, you will start loving this, some hypergeometric function to F1 tau over 2 plus L tau over 2 plus L, tau plus 2L, 1 minus B, is something. And another nice feature of this, which you can check explicitly from, from this, is the small V behavior. And the small V behavior, I will recap in a second, is that actually, you can see, for instance, for the collinear function, you can see this, just put it in Mathematica, it's actually a very nice uh, exercise. It's not very nice, it doesn't help you much, but uh, you can see that if you take this function and you expand around v equals zero, this grows logarithmically with v. So it has a very mild logarithmic divergence. v, and actually the full answer, one can show that it diverges logarithmically, but in your computer, you will be able to check it for only this. You can also check, given the four-dimensional expression of conformal blocks I gave you, while this is regular around v equals 1. It's just some power expansion, powers of 1 minus v. So, it looks very much like, like this kind of solutions Nima was discussing. So, the conformal blocks, they have a very nice expansion around u equals zero. So, they behave like u to the tau over two times some integer powers of u, and also around v equals one. But if you look at them around, around um, v equals zero, then they behave logarithmically. Now, Armed with this, you are now experts on conformal blocks. Let's try to work out a very neat, nice example. This actually you can do at home, and, and it's, uh, it's the nicest crossing symmetric solution of a conformal field theory that you can think of. So I, I recommend you to try this. And what we will work, so there is a very neat model, which is called generalized free fields. We will work everything for this model, and we will actually learn a lot about this model. So this generalized free field is basic, basically a Gaussian theory and the four-point function so you are assuming you have a scalar field, phi x1, phi x2, x3, x4. And the four-point function is just given by the sum of three diagrams Sorry, I will now where you simply, we contract this with this and this with this, or this with this and this with this, or this with this and this with this. And you assume that the dimension of this phi is some delta phi. It's not necessarily, delta phi is not necessarily d over 2 minus 1, so this is not necessarily a free field, is a generalized free field. So it's not free because this delta is not the delta of a free theory, it's any generic delta, but we compute the four-point function. 
just by doing these weak contractions. Now, this is quite cool. Remember that the weak contraction, uh, so if you have here, this gives you a factor of 1 over x12 to the 2 delta phi, right? And this weak contraction gives you 1 over x34 to delta phi. Here is 1 with, sorry, 1 with 4 and 2 with 3, right? So it's 1 over x14 to delta phi, 1 over x23 to delta phi. And finally, we have this one, which is x13 to delta phi, x24 to delta phi. And remember that conformal symmetry was telling us that this can be written as 1 over a prefactor that was 2 delta phi x34 to delta phi times what we denoted by g u b. And just, just by looking here, so this term will contribute a 1, and that's it. The next term will contribute a u to the delta phi, and the other one will contribute a u over v to the delta phi. Here you are. So this is the nicest four-point function. g u v is 1 plus u to the delta phi, plus u over v to the delta phi. Yeah? It doesn't get nicer than that, actually. Yes. yes. Absolutely. Yeah, now we are going to do that. Well, you are going to do that. But I, I will do, I will tell you how to do it, more or less. But that, that's, yeah. Good. Yes. Yeah. We are introducing them already. I mean, so let me tell you something about them. I don't know what to raise. I don't want to raise anything. But can I erase this computer? Is that okay? So, so what we keep, what I want to keep, is that for generalized free fields, um, sorry. All the questions are nice, anyway. <laughs> so, okay, let, let me write it here, but for generalized three fields, okay, sorry, equation. So, the first point about generalized three fields, so generalized three fields, GUV, is simply one plus u to the delta phi plus u over v to the delta phi. And the, the, one of the beautiful things about these generalized history fields is that it is the simplest consistent conformal field theory. Now we will see that it's consistent with everything, which is also crossing symmetric. So crossing, symmet crossing symmetry for this Is this. And indeed, you can check that this very simple answer satisfies this very nice crossing equation. That should already excite you a little bit. Now, if you are not excited enough, there are this um, ADS-CFT duality, etc., and large n conformal field theories. So, what appears there is this large n conformal field theories, and in the limit in which n is very large, the n of the gauge group, then it turns out that this, you have this cluster decomposition, and cluster decomposition tells you that the four-point function is actually the sum of these three diagrams. So if you take a correlator of something as complicated as n equals four super n mills, actually for very large n, th this is the answer. Then it will have corrections 
like 1 over n squared. So this model is not only very neat and very simple, but also it appears in large n conformal field theories. So now we are going to have fun with, yes. Uh, something like that, so like the, the four-point correlator of these fields. Uh, yes, I, I can tell you more in one second now. <clears throat> yeah, it, it's all fields invariant under this N, so one has to be careful, but yes. Uh, yes, sorry about that. I, I didn't say it too well. So this C is called quadratic Casimir. Sorry about that. And it's a quadratic operator, I, I don't remember by heart, but it has like the second derivative of u plus the second derivative of v with functions of u and v, some, ratio, some polynomials of u and v, plus the u dv. So it, it, it's, it's a quadratic operator in u and v, with derivatives in u and v. Absolutely. And it's the Casimir of the conformal algebra. Yes. But it's very explicit. It's, I, I have it in Mathematica, but uh, I can give it to you. So now we have this answer here, and we can start doing a very nice exercise, which you can do, let's say, with the conformal blocks, the 4D conformal blocks that you have. We are going to try to expand this into 1 plus sum of tau and L of C Maybe this is too much to the left. If people on the right cannot see, please yell. Square u to the tau over 2, f tau l, u over v. So this is the question we will look at. And, uh, and let, let me, <clears throat> yeah, uh, actually, since this is, this is a, a very important equation. I want to write it more in the middle. So let me do the following. <clears throat> so this sum has to be 1 plus u to the delta phi plus u over v to the delta phi. Now, the first thing you can do is you can sit down. Well, you are sit down already. So you can open the computer as soon as this lecture finishes. No need for coffee. And then you can plug the four-dimensional conformal blocks I gave you, right? And you can try to find these coefficients here in such a way that this sum is equal to that sum over there. It's actually simpler than it looks. And the idea is to expand in powers of such set bar. Or u and 1 over v. A beautiful feature of conformal blocks is that if you are expanding in powers of u and 1 minus v, you can actually truncate this sum in tau and in L. And you can recursively, you can one by one, you can find these coefficients. So the hardest bit, you see the first point that you will find is what are the intermediate operators here? Intermediate operators. And this is the question of which taus do you need to choose for the left-hand side to, to have some chance of reproducing the right-hand side. Can you tell me which tau would you plug? Absolutely, 2 delta phi. Good. So, the tau has to be 2 delta phi. Now, if you pick tau equals 2 delta phi, you will see that you can reproduce this u to the delta phi, and you are very excited, but then, you will see that there is a u to the delta phi plus 1 that you need to get rid of because it arises 
from this. And in order to get rid of that, you put another op set of operators with higher and higher spin, but now to delta phi plus two. And one can actually see that the intermediate operators of generalized free fields are operators whose twist is two delta phi plus two n. But here there is no magic. You can actually really try all this by yourselves. And as you will see, it's the basis of the analytic bootstrap. I don't want to spoil the surprise, but it's, it's very nice. And you can already do it with your four-dimensional conformal blocks. Yes. N is any integer. N, sorry, is a positive, non-negative integer. I think that's called natural, maybe. But it's plus 2N. And then, now, these, they have the interpretation. So the operators that, that have these are double trace or double twist operators and are operators of the form phi box to the n, box is d mu d mu, d mu 1, d mu l, acting on phi. So this is a, a little uh, schematic, of course, but the important point is that there are operators, which, uh, and usually the operators are these sort of operators. So they have a spin l, and they have dimension 2 delta phi from here and here, plus 2n plus l, or twist without the plus l. Is that okay? And then, you, once you have sit down and you have computed all these coefficients, you will see something that, you, that makes you, will make you very happy, is that these guys are actually positive. So this is a consistent conformal field theory. And all the OPs are actually positive. You know, it's not really guaranteed, right? The, the conformal blocks are something very complicated. The fact that if you do this, all these Cs will be positive is actually quite cool. And this, we will introduce a name for them because we'll, we'll use them. The ones that you will find, we will call it generalized free fields. Is that okay? So, if you do this exercise, then you will find these generalized three fields with some OP coefficients, which, which uh, make these things work. Is that okay? Yes. Yeah, no, I mean, we are in higher dimensions. Let's say that we are in general dimensions. Well, I, uh, certainly we will not see that here. It's, uh, yeah, we, we can come back to that later. But yeah, but th this is, these are all the symmetries that we have in this model. Yes. Absolutely. Oh, you can, you can look for it. Uh, yeah, I mean, you shouldn't be able to find it. Because if you find it and you act on both sides, you will get a contradiction. So you can look for it. Hopefully, you won't be able to find it. Yes. You are breaking CFT otherwise. Okay. Yes. Oh, no, that's what you will find. So from here, it's not at all clear. What I am telling you is that you can sit down in your computer. You can put uh, this on one side, this sum with some unknowns, C tau L on the left-hand side, right? And then you can expand both sides in powers of set and set bar. And by equating both sides in powers of set and set bar, you will find C zero zero, C zero two, C one zero, you know, it's some exercise. You should be able to do it in one afternoon. But, but it's like very nice exercise. And you will find that all of them are positive. Well, the theory is unitary. So I guess that's the reason. But if you look at the expressions, it's not at all clear, right? It's quite, it's something to be happy about. Yeah. 
So I, I can, well, anyway, so since I am getting a lot of questions, I, I will write that formula in two minutes. Yes, if, yes. Good. So there is already something very strange going on here. And this is the reason why this is a very neat, useful model. Look at this equation. Let's look at the equation on the top. The equation on the top is actually very strange. And the reason why this is very strange, this very simple model, there is something weird going on, even for our standards. So the reason why this is strange is because the right-hand side, the right-hand side, diverges as a power law as V goes to zero. But I have told you that each conformal block on the left-hand side diverges as a logarithm. Right? So each term on the left-hand side diverges as a logarithm, but somehow the right-hand side diverges as a power law. This is quite weird. And the reason why this is possible is because the left-hand side has infinite operators. If you sum any finite number of conformal blocks, let's say 10 to the 10 to the 10 to the 10, just to say a number, that will diverge logarithmically as V goes to zero. That's not enough. The only way in which you can get a divergence, which is a power law, is because we have an infinite number of operators. And for generalized free fields, sorry, so this four. L. And the reason why this is possible is because in generalized free fields, for a given twist, we have an infinite tower of operators with a spin 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, etc. And furthermore, there is, there is uh, another little point, and is that this infinite, this divergence arises from the large spin sector. Is that okay? So this is already quite remarkable, actually. And, and as we will see, this will be the basis for, for a lot of things we will be doing. Now, it is, th this is super explicit. So just to make something super explicit for you, let, let's try to see this phenomenon. I'm not sure what to raise. Uh, I have to raise something. So let's take, let, let's, try to, let's try to understand this in the small u limit. I, I, I want to keep this. So sorry, so let me erase here. So this weirdness is easier to understand or to see. Imagine that you consider the small u limit. Now, if you consider the small u limit on the left-hand side, we are keeping the leading power of u, so we are keeping the smallest possible twist, right? So on the left-hand side, what we will have is only leading twist operators, so operators where tau is just 2 to the delta phi, and L is 0, 2, etc. And then we will have some OP coefficients, 2 delta phi, 
L square, and here we will have u to the delta phi, because for these operators, um, the twist is 2 delta phi. And here, if we take the small u limit of these functions, recall that that was these nice hypergeometric functions we have here. So this is f to delta phi, l col, which I have defined on the right-hand side, v. And this magically has to reproduce. So I am taking out the one on both sides. Has to magically reproduce this. And the OP coefficients you will find, I can tell them to you, just also to answer your question, what is their form? They are a little hard to guess, I guess. Uh, generalized three fields. That's what we call zero L, is this ones. And they are two gamma function of two delta phi plus L minus one, gamma function square delta phi plus L, divided by gamma two delta phi plus two L minus one. I checked this yesterday evening, so it may not be correct. No, it's correct. Delta phi. So, here, everything is absolutely explicit. So the OP coefficients, I am giving them to you. These functions here are just these hypergeometric functions here. And, and then you can explicitly check, just with Mathematica, that each hypergeometric function diverges logarithmically as v goes to zero. But of course, it is wrong to take the limit of each summand and they tra then try to sum. What one needs to do, you need to do the sum, and then you take the small v limit. And if you do that, one can indeed check that this sum, well, this sum is equal to the right-hand side because that's how we found these OP coefficients, indeed uh, presents that, that beautiful feature. Is that okay? Yeah, you can check all of them, but, but I, I, I thought it was simpler. And then we will work in the afternoon with a very neat toy model that already shows everything. But look at this sum. So this is, by the way, we have, this is an identity, so to say. If you take these hypergeometric functions and you plug this back here and you sum, you get this right-hand side. And the beautiful thing of generalized free fields is a super simple model where you can compute absolutely everything, right? It, it looks hard to you, but people have spent 15, 20 years trying to compute things in conformal field theories. And we will compute these things in half an hour. So it's worth the effort. So please, uh, we will even compute things they couldn't compute, even after 20 years. And with this, you can compute these things. You know, so it's worth the effort. I know it's a little technical, but this gives you something that is extremely explicit. And, and the way you do it, you can do it around v equals 1, but then if you go to v to 0, of course, these things are very bad behaved, but this function, this sum, exactly gives you this. Is that okay? Yeah? Yes. Oh, good. Because I just to, to make things as simple as possible, I have taken the very small u limit, and then I only focus, you can, in principle, you can, absolutely, but I have focus in the smallest uh, u. So it's the smallest tau. So it's this, the, the tower with n equals zero. So this is the simplest function that you can check in Mathematica, plug, and this is true in every number of dimensions for all delta phi, so it's a very nice, neat formula. And we will use it later on. That's why I am writing it down. Is that okay? Yeah? So can I have like 10, 15? I don't know whom to add. Yeah? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Good. So now 
Is that okay? Is this generalized three fields okay? Good. So now let's forget about generalized three fields. What I am going to say has nothing to do with generalized three fields. I will keep half the equation. So now let's leave our comfort zone of generalized three fields and let's go back to a general conformal field theory. So we are now again back in a completely general conformal field theory. And we have seen in a, in a completely general conformal field theory, we have derived our equation, our bootstrap equation, which was equal to this. So L having this notation here. So this is any conformal field theory, and it's the completely general bootstrap equation that we have uh, derived before. Here, we put a power of v to the delta phi, and on the right-hand side, a power of u to the delta phi. You can check with mathematics that this is the same as this. Yeah? So this is the bootstrap equation in a completely general conformal field theory. This one is the one from the identity operator, which is always present in the OPE of phi with phi. Is that okay? And now we are going to do something to this equation. We are going to consider this equation in the small v limit. Why not? This has to be true for all u and v. In particular, we can do this for a small u and v, for a small v. Sorry. If we do this equation for a small v, this is u to the delta phi, v to the delta phi, 1 from the identity operator, plus something of the order of the tau, sorry, v, to the next tau. And here, we are assuming that the next operator after the identity operator has some twist tau, which is different from zero. This is, you can have a look at the unitarity bounds we just uh, wrote down before, and you can see that for dimensions higher than two, this is always true. So, if you take the small v limit, right, then we get this equation over there. Sorry, I'm going to... Now, do you see something strange going on in this equation? There is something very funny going on in this equation that i never seen before. What happens is that if v is negative, and you look at the right-hand side, this diverges as a power law. But on the other hand, we just said before that all conformal blocks diverge logarithmically for a small v. Right? So, have you seen this before happening in some other model? Yes, of course. We have seen that this happens in generalized free fields. But now, this is about any interacting conformal field theory. Right? So, what we have seen is that in any interacting conformal field theory, the only way this is going to work. The only way in which you can reproduce a power law divergence from logarithmic divergences is if you have an infinite number of operators. So this is already a beautiful result, infinite number of operators. So the first conclusion is that in any conformal field theory, 
we need an infinite number of primary operators. But even more than that, even more than that, we have seen that the divergence has to arise from the large spin region. But that means, look now at the powers of u. Look at the powers of u here, and look at the powers of u on the left-hand side. That means that a divergence should arise from the large spin region. And there should exist a lot of operators of larger and larger spin such that the twist must approach tau equals to delta phi. Or more generally, you see again that this is not enough, but this has to be, as before, plus 2 to the n. And now the difference with, um, with before is that this has to be true only for large spin, because it is only from the large spin region that this divergence should arise. Uh, well, I mean, you, we need to reproduce this divergence on the right-hand side, no matter what, right? And this divergence will be reproduced from uh, a lot of operators with higher and higher spin, whose twist has to be 2 delta phi, just to match this. Right-hand side. So we are here, right? Of course, we can have other things. But the thing with the smallest v just is this one. So this implies this. We will come back in, in next lecture to, to these things. And, and furthermore, it also follows that the OP coefficients of these operators, whatever they are, they have to be very similar to the OP coefficients of generalized free fields. Because you have seen that in order to reproduce this divergence, you needed first that tau is equal to 2 delta phi, and second, the precise OP coefficients. And again, the statement is that these are the generalized three fields coefficients up to corrections of, of order 1 over L. Yes? It could be. I'm just being very, very... We will be incredibly specific about that. It's something that goes to zero for large spin. Yes. <laughs> yes. Right. So the, this... Uh, uh, the, yeah. So the theory should have should have these operators, at least. And, and, um, and, and, and if the operators, these operators could be degenerate, but then it means that for large spin, their sums of OP coefficients have to go to that. Yes. So, but let, let me, why? Sorry, let me conclude because I haven't concluded. And then we, we, we can, I can take, I, I will finish and then I can take all the questions. I, I have to say only one more statement. So, notice that this answer, this result, is a completely general result. So, what we have proven, what we have proven, is that is actually very remarkable. We have proven that in any interacting or not 
conformal field theories, if O is part of the spectrum, phi, sorry, if phi is part of the spectrum, then the conformal field theory should also contain towers of higher spin operators whose, for large spin, whose dimension, whose twist approaches 2 delta phi plus 2n, and whose OP coefficients approach that. This is an absolutely robust and general result about the spectrum of conformal field theories. And we have only used conformal symmetry, the extractor of the OPE, crossing symmetry, extremely general results, right? Extremely general results, and the presence of the identity operator. So this, we will now, in, in, in the afternoon, we will take this to the next level, uh, and we can try, we will try basically to work out for conformal field theories all these towers of corrections in inverse powers of the spin. But this is, you know, it would be impossible to prove these things in other ways. So to get results for generic conformal field theories, which are theories in which you cannot even do computations, is awfully hard, right? These theories don't need to have a Lagrangian. They may not be integrable. They are not super symmetric, right? They can live in, in, in any number of dimensions, and we have derived this beautiful result. Yes, so now, yeah, I can go back to the question. Right, so, so I ha we have used notice, by the way, that, the, that these OP coefficients, the ones we have derived, are consistent with unitarity. Sure, but, but in, in, um, for, for in an expansion in large L, this will be much smaller than the one. Yeah, but, but this is a good question, actually. I, I will return to the question of unitarity. Yeah, yes. Oh, absolutely. So the small, so let's say that you fix the power of u, right? And you say, let's say that you take only the first 1,000 spins, that will still diverge logarithmically. Because you have only 1,000 conformal blocks. Yes, but you can. Because the point is, we cannot say anything yet about a small spin region. We can only say something about the large spin region. And the reason is that if you look at the left-hand side and you ask which regions of spins are the one responsible for giving me this divergence as v goes to zero, the answer is the large spin region. Well, you can, yeah, that, that's fine. It's like saying, imagine that I give you an integral dx, right, between zero and infinity. This is infinity, right? And, and if you do the integral between 10 to the 3 and infinity, it's also infinity. So you can ignore any finite spin. No matter how large, you can actually ignore it. That doesn't affect the answer. Yeah. This divergent answer, we will actually improve on that. Yes. Beautiful. Tau is bigger than zero. Of course, you have two-dimensional theories in which tau can get actually very close to zero. We will actually deal with these situations too. But one has to be a little bit careful. In these situations, you have to do... All. The problem is that sometimes an infinite number of operators have very similar twist. In all these cases, you first have to sum, and then you have to take v small. It's a little bit more subtle. But it's a good observation, Andrew. Very good, yeah. Any further questions? If not, um, let's thank Fernando.